On this prequel episode, we've got our fan poll follow-up to the Polar Express. We're learning about Chuck Jones and previewing the Phantom Toll Booth. Hello and welcome back to this Fun Slip podcast where we talk about movies that are based on books. We're back after a very short hiatus. Took one week off after the holidays. It's a nice break. It's a nice little break. <laughs> we do this every week. Other than that, I think we've missed one other week where we were moving or something, maybe. Yeah, last time when we moved, we yeah, had a... That was around the same time of year. Off. It was February. Yeah. Anyways, uh, we're back. We've got our prequel episode. We've got all of our normal segments, so let's get into our first one, which is our patron shout-outs. Three new patrons since the last time we did this, all at the Hugo Award-winning level. Uh, at least one of them I know specifically so they could check out our Little Women 2019 review. And our new patrons are Teresa Schwartz. The name looks familiar. <laughs> no Ramirez and Bree DeWitt. The name also looks familiar. <laughs> Thank you all three of you for supporting us at $5 a month, getting access to the bonus content, which will be coming more regularly. We're going to start scheduling that out mm -hmm. so that we don't fall behind and you get your money's worth. Uh, but we appreciate you supporting us nonetheless. And we have our Academy Award winner, Hall of Fame patrons. And they are Winchester's Forever, Kelly Napier, Gray Hightower, Eli Young, Scratch, Just Scratch, Shelby Says Black Lives and Trans Lives Matter, Love Actually Does Exist, Brian with the Hot Take. I don't know what that's a reference to. Well, during the Polar Express episode i made a thing about believing in love and or something i think that's what it's in oh, reference okay. to because at first i when i first read it i thought it was in reference to the terrible movie right uh, i say terrible i've never seen it i've just heard it's terrible um or at least it has not aged well <laughs> um <laughs> uh and that's what i thought at first but i'm thinking in reference that it, in in since then it's actually in reference to when we were discussing like the belief and stuff in uh -huh. polar express mm -hmm. And I talked about, you know, at least if it had been a message about love and, like, believing in love, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing, because love actually does exist or something. I don't know. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I'm guessing that's what that's in reference to. And we appreciate you, as always, changing your name to keep up with the times. And finally, our highest patron, the queen that shall not be unseated, probably. I don't know. At least so far. Our very first patron. First patron yes, and... First patron ever. And first patron ever and... Highest, they have to be the highest because they've been the longest yes. and at the highest level. So, yes. Alina Doletkolova, we appreciate you all so very much uh, and can, for continuing to support us. Uh, we appreciate it, and you're all fantastic. Let's go ahead and see what people had to say about our thoughts on Polar Express. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. So we had a lot of feedback on these polls. Um, I just full disclosure, I know we've talked about this, but I did edit comments down, yeah. um, especially some of the longer ones so that we could, you know, get through this a little more quickly. On Facebook, we had four votes for the book, zero votes for the movie. Mm -hmm. um, Colin said the book by Miles. Joni said, the book, I think the movie is creepy, which is a sentiment that was repeated yes. quite frequently. That was the only thing I knew about the movie yeah. before we watched it. Was, was that, that people, people thought, thought it was creepy, yeah. yeah. And Karen said, definitely the book. I had never read the book as a kid, so it was weird to see friends losing their shit because they were so excited about what ended up being a creepy, hollow <laughs> movie. I recently heard the book read for the first time at work. It was a simple and fairly charming story. There you go. Uh, over on Twitter, we had 10 votes for the book and one for the movie. Um, Gray at Great High at Gray High Tower said the book obviously this movie is hot garbage and is one of the few Tom Hanks Tom Hanks movies that he does not urinate in, which I did not a, know that was this that's that like, like a, a famous thing with Tom thing. Hanks is he, that he he goes in the ends bathroom and urinating in movies quite often yes interesting it's an interesting thing to be. I mean, that's obviously not the only thing he's known for, but it's an interesting no. thing to be known for. I mean, three that jumped ahead of my mind. I, I had heard this, but three that jumped to my mind immediately that I can even remember, like, the scenes, I'm fairly certain, is uh, Forrest Gump, um, Castaway, mm -hmm. and uh, The Green Mile. So, 
Interesting. I'm sure there are others, but those three, I'm pretty sure. Are, I think are if he had scenes. if he had urinated in this one, it would have taken it to like a really weird place. Uh, I think they could have gotten away with it with the hobo character if they had really That's wanted fair. to. Yeah, they had, yeah. I mean, I, even I, still, I still I'm think not that sure. would have taken it to yeah. a weird place with kids movie. Uh, yeah, they could have maybe figured out a clever way to do it, like kind of tongue in cheek, if they had wanted to. I'm yeah. not saying they should have. But I'm just saying. <laughs> Anyways. Um, Kelly Napier at Standby for Live said, I agree the movie isn't a cinematic masterpiece. The book is better, but instead of trying to critique it as a serious piece of cinema, approach it as the dream of a boy of a certain age who is starting to question the world around him. He does grow as a character through the film. He learns to believe in himself, which helps him realize that it's okay to keep believing in Santa and the magic of Christmas, even when no one else does. At its core, the movie and the book are about capturing the feeling of Christmas as a child. The magic, the whimsy, the faith. To peel back the curtain too far goes against what the whole thing is going for in both mediums. Yeah. I don't entirely disagree with some of that. Um, I think there is something to be said for letting a movie be what it's trying to be without necessarily overanalyzing it. Mm -hmm. I think there is something to be said for that. But I also think it's kind of what we do is at least thematically try to like get to the core of a film yeah. and discuss whether or not we think it works as opposed to like overanalyzing and nitpicking, which I don't think we did. We did a little bit probably because when movies I found for me, when movies fail, when I find feel that movies fail thematically, it, it, you be, it's easier to also nitpick them. Like, yes, I agree. You know what I mean? Yeah. Those kind of tend to go hand in hand. Whereas if it works thematically, I'll overlook some of the more like little details um, but it is kind of what we do. And I think it, mm -hmm. I, the, the main thing I would disagree with, I think, is instead of trying to critique it as a serious piece of cinema, I think you should be able to do that with almost any movie, at least to some extent. Again, there's a fine line between um, well-meaning critique and like overanalyzing something yeah. that isn't meant to be that deep. Yeah. Um, but I, I think I think we kind of tried to ride that line. But I, I see what I see what Kelly's saying in some parts. Right. Yeah, I think we do try to read that line and, and there there is absolutely a place for pieces of art that aren't meant to be taken seriously yeah um or even not necessarily taken seriously but not i i do think yeah. though that this particular film was striving for something thematic yeah and i i think for us it just didn't quite get there yeah yeah, and, and, and that you know, and that's the thing with thematic elements that's tough is because they can land differently for different people, yeah. obviously, when you're coming to them from different backgrounds, uh, or you know, or different uh, belief systems or whatever. Um, certain thematic elements can work for some people and not for others. Um, and it, like we said, it didn't really work for us, but you know, um, I definitely think that it was going for something and uh, it it works in some ways, but in other ways it doesn't. But uh, I appreciate Kelly's feedback. Uh, I still slightly disagree, but, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. All right. And uh, Shelby Suderman at Shelby Suderman said, if there's one thing I respect, it's ambition. And this movie is so <laughs> in love with its book and tries so hard to measure up that I can't possibly hate it. It only succeeds maybe a quarter of the time, but it was adorable. That being said, I'm still giving it to the book because of the tighter narrative, better message, and the fact that it didn't have the hot chocolate dance, the caribou noise, or Tom Hanks being needlessly scary. My takeaway is the same as it was when I first saw the movie. The main character is creative enough to ask Santa for part of his sleigh, but not enough to ask for a <laughs> flying reindeer of his own so he can ride. True. I, I want, like... The, Shelby's comment made me think of this. I want like a follow up to this kid as an adult because I bet he grows up to be a literature professor because he asked for he could have asked for anything in the world and he asked for a piece of symbolism. Yeah. <laughs> Who does that? Yeah. For real. Yeah. Um, I think there's some inherent messaging. I know she's joking, yeah. but uh, there's some inherent messaging about like humility and that sort of thing. Yes. That. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, I agree. Um the other thing that I do agree, I guess, in general, that um, I mean, it definitely goes for it. It does. We talked about it's weird because it does feel like it's definitely trying to be like a huge homage to the book. Like mm -hmm. in certain ways, we talked about certain elements that look, you know, they were definitely trying to mimic the visual style mm -hmm. yeah. with the animation um, and, you know, specific lines and stuff that they kept verbatim. Um, 
and it did seem like they were trying their best to to just do the book justice but at the same time it has so it had so much sort of just like artifice stacked on top like not yeah. artifice well, not the there's, right word, there was a, a lot spectacle of spectacle stacked yeah, on top spectacle. of it spectacle there was a lot of padding like yeah. it seemed to me like they just couldn't quite quite flesh it out into a longer story like they couldn't really figure out how to do it I, I they really this wanted is, to ideally but... this would have been a 45 minute tv like made for t- yeah. you know like the grinch stole crit like yeah. that yeah, kind yeah, of thing yeah, so yeah. it's like 45 minutes or isn't that how long that is like some it's th- like an hour ballpark, less than an yeah. hour or something like that um where this had been like an hour long tv special with commercials so it was like 45 minutes <laughs> they could strip out so much and i think it would have been so much better as opposed to like a feature length you know yeah it's got to fill an hour 30 um, which there's just no way from the book you're gonna you're gonna get there. Mm-hmm. On Instagram, we had eight votes for the book and three for the movie. Um, li- uh, Library Juju said the book is better, hands down. Um, the Leap underscore seventy seven said the book without question is better. I read the book as a kid and saw the movie as an adult. Even though I was in my pretentious film watching phase, not even the nostalgia could save this. This film is hollow, tells you to believe in something because someone tells you to, and also makes me realize no amount of CGI can replace humanity. <laughs> um. M. Therese 5340 said, The book because the movie's CGI boy looks like a zombie. There you go. And no, Ramirez uh, Y. Patron. Yes, this is our patron, um, Ramirez YT. Mm-hmm. Maybe YouTube. I don't know. YouTube. Maybe not. Let us guessing. know. No, <laughs> I don't, it could not be that at all. It's just <laughs> sometimes people throw that at the end for a YouTube channel or something. Uh, they said, so this is not the right choice, but I can't help but love this movie. I agreed with everything you said, but I can't help <laughs> but love the movie. It was one of the first movies I remember watching in the theater. I'm blinded by nostalgia with this one. I like the movie, but if I'm using my critic brain, of course the book is better. Oh, we discussed that. Yeah. That if, that if there was going to be somebody who really loved the movie, that it would be, because it is a spectacle, and I could see mm-hmm. if I watched that in the theater when I was, Yeah, some somebody you who know, watched it in kid. the theater, saw it as a kid, is definitely going to remember this. Yeah. Unless you were scared of it. Unless you were scared of it. I could definitely <laughs> see remembering it fondly. Yes. Um, if I had seen that in theaters as a child, because there's definitely movies that, <laughs> if I revisited now, that I'm sure I had fond feelings of, uh, I would not feel that way anymore, mm-hmm. so... Yeah, no, I totally, totally understand. What was the final tally? So our final tally, the book blew the movie out of the water, mm-hmm. absolutely destroyed it, 22 votes to four. I was about as expected, to be fair. Yeah. Very beloved book, not so much uh, as a movie. All right, we're going to go ahead and get to our Learning Things segment, and this week we're learning about Chuck Jones. No matter what anybody tells you, Words and ideas can change the world. So I had puzzled a little bit over what we could do for our Learning Things segment for this one because I knew I know nothing about this movie. Yeah. And I I missed this book as a kid. I guess we just didn't have a copy of it laying around. I never heard of it Um, at all. So I didn't really know all that much about the books. So I was like, ah, well, what can we learn about? Um, and then I was kind of, you know, doodling around and looking at stuff. And I saw that Chuck Jones made this movie. And I thought, OK, he's a, a, an iconic figure in animation. So what about Chuck Jones? There you go. Um, So Chuck Jones was an American um, animated filmmaker and cartoonist, uh, best known for his work with Warner Brothers on the Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies um, properties. Um, He was born in 1912 in Spokane, Washington, and his family later moved to Los Angeles. Jones has credited his artistic bent to... Um, His father, who was an unsuccessful businessman, I love this story. Um, So his father would start out every new business venture by purchasing new stationery and new pencils that had his new company name on them. And then when the business failed, he would give the stacks of now useless paper and pencils to his children um, and ask them to like use it up as quickly as possible. So they had like this never ending supply of paper and pencils 
So they just drew like all the time. Um, And actually a couple of his siblings also went on to have artistic careers, (laughs) according to the Internet. Um, So there you go. Um, Your failure can result in someone else's (laughs) tremendous success. True. (laughs) I mean, that's <laughs> literally like the book definition of capitalism. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so Jones graduated from uh, a name of an art institute that I'm about to butcher. Um, Schoenard? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I took some French and I don't it's, know. Ooh, I took so much French and I have no no idea how to say this. Schoenard? No, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so he graduated from that place um, and uh, got a job at, um, this is another thing that I should have looked up how to pronounce. I don't know if it's Ub Iwerks or UB Iwerks. Do you know? I don't know. I've never seen mm-hmm. that. Like that. Um, so uh, that was an animation house um, and he worked his way up through the animation industry. I'm um, starting out as a cell washer. Um, he joined uh, Leon Schlesinger. Schles- That's a tough one. Schlesinger Productions. Or Schlesinger. Schlesinger. Maybe. Productions. Either way. Um, which was an independent studio that produced Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies for Warner Brothers. Um, he joined up with them in 1933 as an assistant animator and was promoted to um, animator in 1935. Um, he was also actively involved in efforts to unionize their, the staff while at that studio um, and eventually served as moderator of the Labor Management Committee. Boss. <laughs> um, during the Second World War, uh, Jones worked closely with um, Theodore uh, Geisel. That's, yeah, I believe that's right. That sounds, I, that, that sounds familiar, at least. <laughs> I'm really doing, I mean, I'm doing a bang-up job with the names familiar, in though. this segment. Um, but better known as Dr. Seuss. We had this discussion when we talked about Dr. Seuss. Yeah, I know. I think Geisel. That was a long time ago, though. I think, I think it is Geisel. Geisel. Um, and they created a series of Army educational cartoons. You've probably seen clips of that kind of stuff here mm-hmm. and there, um, like propaganda cartoons. Um, And then Jones later collaborated with Seuss on animated adaptations of Seuss's books, including one that we mentioned earlier, uh, the 1966 TV special of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Um, Jones continued to create characters throughout the late 1930s, the late 40s, and the 50s, uh, which included his collaborative collaborative help in co-creating Bugs Bunny. Um, and also included creating his four most popular creations, Marvin the Martian, Pepe Le Pew, Wile E. Coyote, and The Roadrunner. Um, he left Warner Brothers in 1962, and their, uh, their cartoon studio actually closed soon after. Um, he was then contracted by MGM to produce new Tom and Jerry cartoons. Um, after that wound down, he went on to work on TV specials such as the aforementioned Grinch one um, and Horton Hears a Who. But his main focus during the late 60s was the Phantom Tollbooth. More on that later. There you go. Um, MGM closed their animation division in 1970, and he started his own studio, Chuck Jones Enterprises. Um, He produced a Saturday morning children's TV series called The Curiosity Shop. He also worked on animated TV adaptations of short stories from Rudyard Kipling's Mowgli's Brothers, um, The White Seal, and Ricky Ticky Tavi. I had to mention that one because I had the Ricky Ticky Tavi cartoon on VHS when I was a kid and wore it out. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know he created Marvin the Martian. That's my dad's favorite um, Looney Tune. Yeah, he was responsible for quite a few iconic characters. I knew Bugs Bunny, but... Or, yeah, didn't know Marvin the Martian. Uh, Throughout the 80s and 90s, Jones was the creative consultant and character designer for two Raggedy Ann animated specials and the first Alvin and the Chipmunks Christmas special. Um, He also served on the advisory board of the National Student Film Institute, and in 1999, he founded the nonprofit Chuck Jones Center for Creativity, which is dedicated to teaching creative skills primarily to children and seniors, and that uh, 2020 notwithstanding is still in operation. There you go. 
Um, Jones received an honorary Academy Award in 1996 by the Board of Governors um, for the creation of classic cartoons and cartoon characters whose animated lives have brought joy to our real ones for more than half a century. Um, Robin Williams presented the award, referring to Jones as the Orson Welles of cartoons, and he received a standing ovation from the audience when he accepted his award. A couple things that I really loved here, one thing in particular, um, in interviews, Jones often recalled a small child who, when told that Jones drew Bugs Bunny, replied, he doesn't draw Bugs Bunny, he draws pictures of Bugs Bunny. <laughs> Um, his point was that the child thought the character of, of the character as being alive and believable, which was, in Joan's belief, the the key to true character animation. Mm -hmm. So he did it. Yeah, he nailed it. Um, Jones passed away in February of 2002 at the age of 89. Uh, he's considered a historical authority on as well as a major contributor to the development of animation throughout the 20th century. Awesome. I knew a little bit about Chuck Jones. I mean, I'd heard of him, and, but I didn't know all of that. That was fascinating. Let's go ahead and learn a little bit now about the Phantom Tollbooth novel. Follow Butch Patrick on a fantastic trip through the Phantom Tollbooth, where nothing is real but your imagination. To Dictionopolis, where words are weird. Words in a word are fantastic. You can hint them, you can say them, you can print them, you can pray them, emphasize them, and despise them. All right, I got carried away with my book facts. There was so much good stuff. <laughs> got a lot there, yeah. Yeah. So the Phantom Tollbooth is a children's fantasy adventure novel written by Norton Juster with illustrations by Jules Pfeiffer, originally published in 1961. So Norton Juster was an architect, actually, um, and in 1960 he applied for and received a $5,000 grant from the Ford Foundation, um, and he wanted to write a children's book about cities because he felt that it was very important that children appreciate cities. I don't know. <laughs> architect things. Um, so he started that out very enthusiastically um, and then eventually ground to a halt. Uh, too many notes, too little progress, all very relatable. Um, but his guilt over that lack of progress on that book uh, actually led him to write pieces of stories about a little boy named Milo, which he then began to develop into a book. Um, his imagination supposedly was further fired by a boy who approached him on the street and with whom he discussed the nature of infinity. I don't know if that's a real story. It kind of sounds like a made up story, <laughs> but nah. Um, so Juster ended up wanting to finish the story about a boy who asked too many questions before returning to his book about cities, which I'm sure was now sounding very boring. <laughs> Um, so Jester had a roommate. He shared his house with cartoonist Jules Pfeiffer. Um, at one point, Jester showed Pfeiffer the draft, and without even having to ask him, the artist started sketching illustrations for it. Apparently mm -hmm. liked it so much, started drawing the pictures. Um, and from there, we uh, get kind of a good example of um, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, Pfeiffer knew a woman named Judy Sheftel, Sheftel mm -hmm. who put together deals in the publishing trade um, and actually ended up marrying him later on, but oh. that's not super important. Um, and she knew Jason Epstein, who was an innovative editor at Random House, who had a deep appreciation for children's oh. literature. She got him to review the manuscript and based on about seven chapters plus an outline for the remainder of the story, Epstein went ahead and bought the book. Um, despite some at Random House being concerned that the vocabulary might be too difficult for young readers. Back to the illustrations. I thought this was funny. Um, Juster apparently did all of the cooking in the house that he shared with Pfeiffer. Mm -hmm. So if Pfeiffer wanted to eat, he had to do the drawings. Um, and it apparently became like a game between them with uh, Pfeiffer trying to draw things the way that he wanted them and Jester trying to describe things that were like more and more outlandish and mm -hmm. impossible to sketch. And apparently um, 
there is a character in the book called the Weatherman, and apparently um, Pfeiffer like got his revenge by caricaturing Jester as the Weatherman, mm. like sketching him in a toga. Um, so the book went through a couple of edits. Um, it altered the protagonist's name, which at one point was Tony and not Milo, um, removed his parents entirely from the book, with who needs parents, um, and deleted some text that attempted to describe how the toll booth package was initially delivered to Milo. Uh, Milo's exact age was also removed from the text. Early drafts aged him at around eight or nine, but Jester decided not to state it directly because he was worried about potential readers deciding that they were too old hmm. to care, which is something that I've heard um, like when you're picking books for kids, yeah. um, that kids prefer to read about other kids who are like a little bit a little older, older yeah. than themselves. Um, so maybe a wise choice, right? Yeah, Leave sense. it up to the imagination. Um, so the Phantom Poll Booth was the Phantom Toll Booth published in September of 1961, and it was not an immediate success. Um, it faced some strong competition from Roald Dahl's James and the Giant Peach, um, as well as Elizabeth George Spears' The Bronze Bow, which won that year's Newbery Award. Um, but the book was rescued from obscurity when Emily Maxwell wrote a strong review of it in The New Yorker. She wrote, as Pilgrim's Progress is concerned with the awakening of the sluggardly spirit, the phantom toll booth is concerned with the awakening of the lazy mind. Um, after publication... Uh, just real quick, yeah. I will say, it was funny, I was thinking about the writing characters that are slightly older than the mm -hmm. reader. I think the biggest counterpoint to that would be the Harry Potter series. Yeah. I think the majority of the audience, at least for like my, me, I was, I don't know what time most people would start reading those. Maybe when they were a little bit younger, but it came out when I was 11 or 12. Well, I mean, that so would... I was always like a year ahead. You know what I mean? I was always like a year older. I was like I right on Harry's age until the books started to like yeah. space out. But at that point, I was in it. Right. I was pretty close, but I was a little bit, I feel like I was a little bit ahead. Because when did the first one come out? 99? 98? 99, I wanted to say. If it was 99, then I was 11. Or ni so no, maybe 90. I don't know. Eh, whatever. I don't know. If it was 99, <laughs> then I was 11. But it was. Anyways, I, I was just something I was thinking about. But eventually, very quickly, got ahead of it. Yeah. Anyways, um, but I, I do th I think that, like, kind of curves around the older that a kid gets, though. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I was just... Anyways, it doesn't yeah. matter. I think it, it makes sense. Like, that, yeah. that just kind of, you know, without thinking, you know, without any research, it makes sense that kids would want to read about someone just a little bit older. Mm -hmm. It's like what's coming as opposed to what they've already done. You know, it's right. more interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, after publication, Jester sent a copy of the book to the Ford Foundation, um, who originally gave him the grant to write a city's book. Um, so he sent them a copy of it along with an explanation of how his projected project uh, transformed into the Phantom Toll Booth. Uh, he didn't hear back from them, but apparently learned years later that they were actually delighted by that turn of events. So it all turned out for the best. Um, the book has continued to be popular since its publication. Um, it's moved into classroom use. It's been published in several different languages. Um, an annotated version of the novel, which includes sketches and copies of Jester's handwritten drafts and word lists, as well as um, Pfeiffer's early drawings, has been released. Um, numerous authors have commented and written on the Phantom Tollbooth as a source of inspiration for them, including Philip Pullman, um, Mo Willems, and Suzanne Collins, who wrote The Hunger Games. I was like, I know Suzanne Collins. Yeah. Familiar. It's actually right there on my, yep. Um, the case, I, just saw, I just saw Collins on the, I was just <laughs> looking at that book down there, The Hunger Games. Anyway. Um, Philip Pullman wrote... Um, that's familiar too. Um, um, I can't think of the name of the series, but it's uh, the the Golden Compass. Um, it's, it's that uh, uh, his dark materials. His dark materials. Yeah. I kept wanting to call it Mortal Instruments. But... Um, and Mo Willems is a, a picture book of children's author um, who's written quite a bit. Um, Jester feels that his book does still have relevance today, although children's lives have changed just a bit. <laughs> Since a 1961, bit. A bit. Um, he has stated, 
When I grew up, I still felt like that puzzled kid, disconnected, disinterested, and confused. There was no rhyme or reason in his life. My thoughts focused on him, and I began writing about his childhood, which was really mine. Today's world of texting and tweeting is quite a different place, but children are still the same as they've always been. They get bored and confused and still struggle to figure out the important questions of life. Well, one thing has changed. As many states eliminate tolls on highways, some children may never encounter a real toll booth. Luckily, there are other routes to the lands beyond, and it is possible to seek them and fun to try. It's nice. <laughs> but yeah, that is true <laughs> that the toll booth is going to be the most archaic Yeah, right. Part of... <laughs> what the heck is a I toll booth? I haven't been through a toll booth. I don't remember the last time I um, drove through a toll booth. I feel like I drove through a toll booth... I went. I don't I, think I I've ever driven like me like driving. I don't know if I've been the person driving through a toll booth in my life. I don't think I was driving, but I'm pretty sure I went on a trip to Florida in college with some friends, and I'm pretty sure we drove through a toll. Yeah, there are definitely some. I'm because I remember. I mean, we went to Florida on but vacation I don't think once. I, was driving. I, I vaguely remember several toll booths. Toll booths. Um, and I, I'm sure we went through at least one or two when we went out west. I think they're more of an east coast thing, though. Yeah, I think I could be wrong about that, know. but I, I, in my head, they there certainly aren't east. any here. Yeah, I, yeah, there's none in the yeah around us anywhere. All right, let's go ahead and learn about the Phantom Toll Booth, the film. Digitopolis, where figures are freaky. Numbers can be added to, subtracted from, divided into, multiplied by, crossed out, and erased. Climb the mountains of ignorance, where dreams become nightmares. We have nothing to worry about. And the monsters are magnificent. It's the gelatinous giant. Pass through the phantom toll booth and into the magic world of your mind. Rated G. The Phantom Toll Booth is a 1970 film also known as The Adventures of Milo in the Phantom Toll Booth. It's directed by Chuck Jones, who we've discussed already, Abe Levitow, and Dave Monahan, uh, who directed the live action segments, which is like the beginning of the film from what I've read. It was written by Chuck Jones and Sam Rosen. It stars Butch Patrick, who plays Milo, Mel Blanc, Dawes Butler, Candy Candido, Hans Conried, June Foray. Uh, Mel Blanc obviously is like the name in there. That's mm -hmm. Bugs Bunny, yeah. <laughs> among other things. But yeah. Uh, the film has a 6.9 out of 10 on IMDb and a 100% critic score uh, with 10 critic reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Hmm. All in the last like 10 years. MGM, so as you kind of mentioned, MGM contracted Chuck Jones and his staff to produce new Tom and Jerry cartoons. And for his first project with MGM Animation slash Visual Arts, Jones read Norton Juicer's. I said Juicer. Is it Juster? I honestly have no idea. Okay. In my head, I read it as Juicer all the time, but it could, either one makes sense. The Dot and the Line, which uh, Chuck Jones ended up adapting into an Academy Award winning animated short film. Uh, and then in 1966, MGM optioned the Phantom Tollbooth, and Jones said, quote, it was a natural progression to another of Juster's works, Juster's works. I would think I was pronouncing it Juster in my head because my uh, phone kept trying to autocorrect it to Jester. I think in my <laughs> head I was saying Juster because I was thinking of, like, Simon and Schuster. Oh, like, yeah. Isn't that a publishing company? Yeah. Or yeah, like Schuster, Juster, maybe. Mm. I don't actually know. I didn't do any research. I didn't even it. think to look that up. Yeah, it's just, I, again, I think I was connecting it with Schuster, which is just the same, but with an SH instead of a J, I think, right? Yeah. It's not O's, right? It's S-H-U-S-T-E-R. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, So I think that's, anyways, doesn't matter. Uh, completed in 1968, the film was held up for release by MGM until the late 70s, or not 70s, until late 1970 due to internal studio problems. The animation studio closed soon after the film's release, uh, which had MGM leaving the animation business for good. It was their first and only hmm. feature-length animated film. A dubious honor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Juster had no input into the adaptation and has expressed his hatred for the film in an interview. Quote, It was a film I never liked. I don't think they did a good job on it. It's been around for a long time. It was well-reviewed, which also made me angry. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> I thought that was funny. 
I kind of love when authors hate the movie adaptations. Yeah. It's so interesting. It's delightful. Uh, and this is the other fun thing. There wasn't a whole lot about this movie because it it didn't get a wide release. Mm. It, it was released um, as a like matinee part of a cart like a like for several weekends at like a few theaters as mm-hmm. like part of matinee showings. It didn't get like a theatrical re- like a real theatrical release. Um, it only kind of gained prominence later on in like home release on like video and stuff. From mm-hmm. what I understand, so there wasn't a whole lot of stuff out there about like you know this isn't like a. I, like I said, I had never even heard of it. This wasn't like a huge beloved film that people yeah. talk about a lot. Um, and for some people, I'm sure it is, but it wasn't a wild, widely popular film. Uh, but I thought this was interesting. In February of 2010, director Gary Ross began, began development of a live-action remake of The Phantom Tollbooth for Warner Brothers, uh, the, who currently own the, the rights to the film. As of 2016, the remake has moved to TriStar Pictures with Michael Vukata... Vukadinovich writing the adaptation. I don't know how to pronounce that, and I don't know who that is. So there was allegedly going to be like another version yeah, of this. It's been in. It seems like it's been in production hell for the last like five. Sorry, uh, the last ten years, decade. It, yeah, yeah. It's, in 2010 they started working on it, and but I mean there was movement as late as 2018 when a new director replaced one who had been assigned to it by TriStar. So TriStar, as of the last that I was able to find, has the rights to the remake, um, and has people attached to it, mm. but nothing has come of it since then that I was able to find. Uh, but who knows? Maybe we will get a live action hybrid remake of the Phantom Tollbooth. I find it unlikely that this would ever get made because again i don't know how much of a demand there is for it especially after something like i don't know i see i wonder because this was optioned in 2010 what year did like the golden compass come out around that time a little bit before because that came out while i was in high school okay because i'm wondering if maybe like they were optioning a bunch of like this lit from that time around this time, looking mm-hmm. for the next Harry Potter, obviously. Mm-hmm. And then maybe saw, oh, the Golden Compass didn't do well. Oh, you know, and maybe there, there was a run of like YA lit movie adaptations yeah, in that, that like that 2010 so period that didn't like crush it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe it just kind of all f- petered out. Now, that being said, uh, supposedly as of 2018, there was still movement on it. So who knows? But. There's movement on lots of I don't of know. I, uh, I haven't finished the book yet, but the idea of, like, um, uh, this era of filmmaking adaptation of this book, I find, like, mildly terrifying because I feel like they're going to do it, like, grimdark. Oh. And I don't, I don't want it. <laughs> no, thank you. It'll be interesting. I'm interested to see... With what you what, with your your reference there, if if this is like going to be weird and trippy, the movie like because yeah. it's like the sixties. I 70s, I, like... I did hear that. Oh yeah, we, yeah, discussed yeah, we did discuss that. Because uh... because uh, I'm thinking because there's some cool. That's not Chuck Jones. It's um the guy who did uh the guy the the company um like the Hobbit movies Rankin and stuff. Bass. No 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 um. Well, Rankin Bass did some of them. Yeah, but there was a different person who did the Lord of the Rings. Um, who did like the trippy ones? Ralph where Bash- some of it's Bakshi. Like, Ralph like, Bakshi. Or some of it's like a rotoscope weird. Yes, like... Ralph Bakshi, who also did the uh, Wizards movie, which is one of my dad's favorite movies. Mm-hmm. It's like these trippy, weird, anim- like, you know, psychedelic 70s animation films that are like mm-hmm. probably kind of boring, but also cool. <laughs> Anyways, I'm wondering if it's going to be at all like that. Uh, So I'm interested to see that. Uh, If you want to watch the film, uh, there's nowhere that it's streaming for free. But as always, you can check your local library or if you still have a video store, go check them out. You can stream it. Uh, It's not uh, we couldn't find anywhere that it was available like, you know, as like Netflix or whatever Mm -hmm. as part of their um, library. But uh, you can rent it through Amazon Prime, YouTube, Google Play, Voodoo, Redbox, etc., for three ninety nine, so it's available. It's not like yeah. it's hard to find. It's just you got to pay for it, most likely. Yeah. Unless maybe in certain countries it might be streaming. Yeah, and I would. I mean, I always. You should check your local library or yeah. like with your video rental store. I do feel like with this one, it might be kind of a long shot. 
but yeah, but it could maybe not for a library. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, a library may have it, but also yeah, I, I you know who know who knows if this ever got like a Blu-ray release or a DVD yeah. release. I don't actually know. I know at some point it did get a home release on like VHS, but it, I'm assuming it probably got a DVD release. But I didn't look into that to see. So who knows? Who knows? Uh, but that's going to do it for this prequel episode. Uh, we're very excited to talk about the Phantom Tollbooth in one week's time. Well, we didn't mention that this is a patron oh, a yes. patron. This request. is a patron request uh, by a one Kelly Napier. So thank you, Kelly, for this recommendation. I'm excited to watch it because, again, I, I never heard of it. And uh, it's always fun when you find something kind of new and interesting. And it sounds fun um, from the synopsis. Not synopsis, but like the... A little blurb like on IMDb of like what it's about. I was like, oh, that sounds cool. Sounds like something I would have been into, yeah. but I also probably as a kid would have thought it was too boring. <laughs> it's like 70s animation. I don't know. I, maybe not, but who knows? Anyways, that's gonna do it for this prequel episode. Until next week when we're talking about the Phantom Tollbooth, guys, gals, non-binary, everybody else. Keep reading books. Keep watching movies. And keep, keep being awesome. awesome.